Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Adam Golov, Marketing and Communications Manager at Data Conversion Laboratory, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know we will allow time at the end of the webinar for questions and answers. So please write your questions in the chat area as they come to mind. If we don't have time to answer them all, we will make them available on our website. Today, we are thrilled to introduce Laura Dawson, founder and CEO of Numerical Gurus, who has consulted to numerous organizations in these verticals, primarily focusing on solving problems related to metadata, identifiers, linked data, semantic web applications, and structured content. We would also like to introduce Brian O'Leary, founder and principal of Magellan Media Consulting, which works with magazine, book, and association publishers to improve how they create, manage, and distribute content. O'Leary also writes extensively about issues affecting the publishing industry. With Hugh McGuire, he has edited a book, a, Future, a Futurist Manifesto, a collection of forward-looking essays on publishing. And lastly, we'd like to introduce Mark Rose, president of DCL, who is a recognized authority on XML implementation and document conversion. Mark also serves as project executive with overall responsibility for resource management and planning. Prior to joining DCL in 1981, Mark was with the consulting practice of Arthur Young & Company. Mark has a Bachelor's of Science in Engineering from Columbia University and an MBA from New York, New York University. He has also taught at the NYU Graduate School of Business, the New School, and Pace University. Mark is a frequent speaker on the topic of automated conversions to XML and SGML. Without further ado, welcome Laura, Brian, and Mark. Uh, thank you, Adam. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity actually today to be part of this webinar. Um, Laura, um, Mark and I have been working to create uh, really a four-part presentation that uh, um, we're going to present to you today. Um, we specifically have, uh, we want to talk about uh, these four things in trouble. And I just want to go to Adam, I'm having trouble getting the uh, slides to advance. Thank you. Um, the first of the sections is what makes metadata right, and Laura will talk, take us through that, as well as managing metadata for physical and digital products, something that, that Laura is uh, intimately familiar with. I'll spend some time talking about how to clearly communicate rights, uh, and then Mark is going to bring us home with uh, an overview and some case studies related to metadata extraction trends. I think before we begin that, though, uh, we wanted to at least have a, a little bit of a uh, presentation about why we think metadata, uh, why why we think about metadata for digital products separately from uh, what's been classically done for physical. The first part is that print itself is not dead, but print alone almost certainly is, meaning that most buys these days involve both or, or multiple formats. And I think as well, the use of online platforms, uh, both uh, established platforms like Amazon as well as the web more broadly, uh, is increasing and it's, it's really the place people go to find and evaluate content. Uh, in certain segments, particularly education, scholarly, and professional publishing, the demand for digital content has never been greater. And I think you'll see that in the case studies that Mark is able to present later in this presentation. Um, the present, but publishers that convert content from any, for, any print format to other digital formats really have to pay special attention when they're creating and maintaining metadata. And that's unique for digital because in many cases, metadata is, has not been created for that particular format. It's often cloned from what was created for print formats, and that introduces errors and some sort of confusion. So with that as background, I'd like to turn it over to Laura uh, to talk about what makes metadata right. Great. Thanks, Brian. Um, so, let's see. Yeah. Oops. Yeah, I'm, it's going to um, be a, an interesting challenge to <laughs> keep from advancing too slowly or too quickly. Um, but basically, when we talk about making metadata right, uh, we're talking about three things. We're talking about accuracy. Um, we're talking about completeness, and we're talking about relevancy. Um, so essentially, this portion of the presentation is something of a manifesto um, regarding metadata, because obviously, um, without it, you're not going to have successful online and digital product discovery. Um, it needs to be harmonized. Um, among products that are comparable, so your digital components and your print components. 
Um, it's visible everywhere. Uh, it's visible not just on Amazon, um, not just on Google. Um, it's visible on Goodreads. It's, it's visible in any number of platforms. So you have to be aware that it's not just you know, the back end that's seeing this stuff. The consumers are seeing it too, and so you have to plan accordingly. Um, and then, um, and Brian will address this uh, more in depth, um, rights are, uh, frankly, a digital mess, and they need uh, care and feeding both near and long term. So we already covered that. So we have four different types of metadata fundamentally. Um, there's bibliographic, commercial, transactional, and merchandising metadata. The bibliographic is what we traditionally think of when we think of metadata for books, um, your basic book information. Um, but then there's commercial uh, metadata, and that includes tax codes, that includes proprietary fields, that includes um, rights information, anything that, um, that, that goes to uh, how much um, and, and how frequently the book is going to be um, uh, sold. Then you've got uh, transactional metadata. So that it is really where the book is, when it's available, how many copies you've got of it, um, ordering and billing information, and royalty and accounting information. Um, and then there's the merchandising um, metadata, the quote unquote sexy metadata. And that's the descriptive content, any marketing copy, buy set codes, um, and then consumer generated content, so rankings and reviews. In terms of product discovery um, today, obviously um, having an ISBN for your book, whether um, physical or digital, is important. Google actively looks for and prioritizes books that have ISBNs. Um, that is their, their, their key identifier uh, when they're sending their spiders through websites. BISAT categories and Amazon keywords, obviously, um, also contribute to discovery. Um, you can SEO your product descriptions by testing them in the Google AdWords app and um, adopting approaches that are embodied in schema.org, which include um, structured metadata in online marketing pages. Publishers are re have really not um, exploited schema.org um, structures and tags as, um, as much as they, they probably should be doing. And then updating metadata as the products move through their life cycle. So metadata is not a static thing. It's something that, that grows and changes with time. And you want to make sure that it accurately reflects where your book is at any given point in time. Laura, this is Brian. The, uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to, to add in, as you, as you might recall, I did some, a metadata study for Book yes. Industry Study Group about four years ago. And right. two things that really struck me uh, in that, one was that um, the BISAC categories are, are critically important, but relatively under-attended. Uh, so mm -hmm. each retailer or, or data recipient does different things with the BISAC categories, and the understanding of that was relatively uh, limited among many publishers that we studied. Uh, but the second piece was that on the last bullet here, the updating metadata as products move through their life cycles. Even things like awards, which you, would think, you think publishers would be keenly aware of and sensitive to, were often maintained not at the level of a publisher or a product, an individual title, but the metadata was updated by retailers who found that it was instrumental in helping to boost sales. So okay. it's an area where anyone who actually owns the, the rights to a particular product, whether it's physical or digital, that there's an important opportunity to keep the metadata up to date so that it, it reflects everything you, you want to know about that book. Yeah, that's true. And um, I, in my boot camp, actually, we just covered the, the BISAC category issue. Uh, there are a number um, of publishers who are still using general BISAC categories as opposed to the specific ones. Um, and that also presents problems with discovery because, of course, um, the specific BISAC categories roll up to the general ones. And if you're only assigning the general one, that makes you a very, very small fish in a very, very large pond. 
whereas if you're assigning very specific targeted BISAC categories, uh, that makes your book uh, easier to find because the, the, the pool of discovery is smaller. Yeah, that's really important to think about, particularly as uh, uh, BISAC has expanded the available codes in areas like uh, young adult and um, right. juvenile. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So on to um, differences and uh, similarities between physical and digital products um, when it comes to metadata. Um, and, and Brian, you can talk a little bit more uh, to this as we go through this as well, um, based on, on your BISG study. Um, but um, essentially, um, metadata is created primarily in um, four different departments. You've got editorial slash managing editorial, uh, marketing, production, and creative services, such as publicity and advertising. Um, the responsibility of uh, metadata management is going to vary from publishing house to publishing house. Um, and as, as Brian was saying before, many publishers treat um, the publication of the book as the end date for updates. And this is uh, beginning to change, but um, we're still not seeing a whole lot of um, post-publication updates to metadata. Um, complete is not the same thing as accurate. You can have all of the given fields filled out um, in your records, um, but um, there's not much attention being paid to what's actually in those fields. So um, it's important, you know, to just basic fundamental things, make sure that there are no spelling errors, for example, no leading spaces. Um, this type of thing um, reduces the, the effectiveness of metadata on discovery. And um, preparing ebook metadata is still to this day somewhat of a scramble. Um, it's, it's done a little bit more ad hoc than um, print metadata pr uh, practices. Trying to change the slide here and it's not working. Adam, can you forward me? Great, thank you. Um, workflows in metadata matter a great deal. Um, price changes, um, digital pre-orders, collapsing cycle times, all of these have an impact on, on the workflow and the metadata that's generated as a result of that workflow. Um, and of course, everyone would like to reduce or eliminate manual intervention. It's never going to go away, um, but everyone would like to see um, more automation and, and less, uh, less fingers on keyboards. Um, you want to structure your workflow to avoid errors, um, to avoid double keying. And um, what we're seeing as metadata leaves the house, there's um, more complexity going downstream. So you've got more consumers adding their own metadata to book records in the form of reviews or ratings that affect sales. Um, and then um, you want to be able to uh, relate one, um, one work to another. Um, this allows the consumer more choice uh, in terms of, you know, are, are, are you going to choose the physical, are you going to choose the digital, are there supplementary works that you want to have related, and that has to happen in the metadata. And um, when it comes to digital metadata or metadata for digital products, um, you've got uh, a lot of complications. So physical uh, metadata about physical products, most uh, retailers want um, at least six months um, in advance, possibly nine months in advance, be the best practice these days. But when it comes to digital products, um, most retailers are not looking for that kind of advance warning. Um, they want to have the metadata when the product is available and usually not before unless it's a big title that they're doing pre-orders on. Um, there are some different attributes, so small things like um, you know, page length as opposed to the file size, um, issues like that. And many publishers are doing more experimentation with price changes, um, and so that's happening more frequently. Um, Conversions, um, as we know, are often outsourced, and the metadata derived from those um, can be a source of, of complication, and Mark will get into that a little bit later. And 
even now, in relative terms, it's a new process. Um, we forget the Kindle came out in 2007, so it's not even 10 years old at this point. So um, it's uh, in, in publishing terms, um, that's that's a blip on the radar. <laughs> True, we've had 500 years to get print right, and 10 exactly. Years. <laughs> yep, on the, exactly. On the, on the uh, conversions piece, uh, we will talk about this at uh, greater length and rights, uh, which is the next section, is a good transition for between um, the more uh, specific metadata discussions and what Mark wants to cover. But uh, I think one of the things that we found uh, also in the metadata study and talking with companies that did these conversions was that uh, they were often left a little bit adrift on the, by publishers. Uh, so publishers would say, just pick up the print metadata and adjust it. But mm -hmm. in certain but in certain cases, the, as you indicated on this slide, there is the data just doesn't exist. It's different attributes. And in other cases, the data may exist, but uh, it's, it's not embedded with the content. So rights, which we'll talk about in a moment, is a good example of metadata that could always be kind of handled separately for physical project products, but cannot be handled separately for digital ones. Right. So. Right. Um, I was alluding um, previously to the different stages in a workflow and the different departments um, where metadata gets created, but this is kind of a functional map um, that, that illustrates that point a little bit better. Um, so certain metadata gets um, created upon acquisition and the creation of a P&L for a project, um, a book project. So at that point, um, you're assigning ISBNs, you're assigning a title and an author and a price, which um, may change as, um, as the, the project evolves. Um, editorial and marketing together tend to assign bias at categories, but it really um, tends to, that function tends to reside in editorial because that is, um, those are the folks who are attuned most early on as to what the book is about, and they create the initial product descriptions. Um, and then uh, when it comes time for production and design, um, at that point the cover image is created, the page counts, um, or um, you know, file size um, gets um, resolved and uh, different format types get assigned. Um, and then at the marketing stage, that's where the market-specific product descriptions um, get completed. And um, they're the ones, of course, who are responsible for sending out advanced copies and getting advanced reviews and confirming the pub date. With luck, all of this metadata resides in a single repository that everyone has access to. And the next slide um, illustrates that a little bit more graphically. Um, that, um, you know, getting into best practices a little bit, um, when you have a single source of truth, as Fran Toulin calls it, um, a, a single repository, you can have multiple contributors um, to that repository, each contributing their, um, you know, their, their silo-specific metadata. Um, and of course, you're going to have multiple recipients of that metadata, and the feeds are going to be tailored. We know, yeah, yes, Onyx is a standard. There are different flavors of Onyx. Different vendors have different requirements. So you're going to uh, fine-tune your feeds from that single source. Um, people have defined roles, um, so while it's really great to have, you know, sort of cross-departmental pollination, um, a publishing house runs uh, pretty effectively with um, very specific designated roles. Um, but the single source of truth allows you to have real-time updates so you're not passing around different versions of spreadsheets and getting confused over who has, you know, who, who has the definitive information um, sitting on their hard drive. Great, so on to rights, Brian, and over to you. Thanks, Laura. Um, as, as I indicated before, rights is kind of a special case. Uh, in, in, uh, in how we think about uh, metadata for digital products. Uh, there are a number of issues actually if affiliated with territorial rights. The first of which is time to market. Uh, it, it had been the case uh, with physical products that we would publish a book and then over a period of months to years negotiate when that product might be made available in a given market, either as a, uh, a, a same language work, an English language work for a North American publisher, say published in the UK, or translation in another market. Uh, however, with 
digital products, they're now visible and um, potentially sellable all around the world as soon as they're published in any one market. And so territorial rights actually become somewhat of a barrier. In a number of cases, the lag time that exists between a work being available in digital form in its home market, say the United States, and elsewhere in the world has resulted in lost sales and some risk of piracy because people try to buy it, they're told that they can't buy it because the rights have not been cleared for that market, and so they look for other sources. The other issues that are specific to territorial rights are that there are no consistent methods for communicating how those, you know, those rights occur. There are some better practices. Book industry study groups have been active in this regard, um, but there's not yet a clear standard for how to regularly communicate, for example, uh, world language rights or this market but not this market or Europe except for the UK. And so therefore, um, the shortcuts that work pretty well when you're talking about physical products don't work at all when you're talking about selling digital products to individual consumers. As well, the, uh, I think it's increasingly the case if you think of about major exports, so Game of Thrones, for example, or Harry Potter, um, that it's, if the book is not available, in addition to the risk of piracy, you also have competition from similar content, including the movies. Uh, Non-book media can play a significant role in taking the same story and bringing it to the attention of consumers in ways that uh, reduce the total of revenue available to book publishers for their works. The thing that I think that this means for folks who are listening today, the first is that the increased visibility on the web is really useful because it helps promote discovery, awareness and discovery. But it also means that you need to be transparent on things like availability and price awareness. You can't simply say, well, this is available in the United States and you'll just have to wait. Or we're selling it for uh, $5 uh, a unit in the, in the United States, but for you it's a higher price. You have to be prepared to address those differences. The other thing is that the, some of the problems that Laura was describing a few minutes ago, which are the inconsistent print and digital metadata, becomes visible and it may hurt sales. If you're describing a, a, a product, for example, for print and you mention the awards but you're not doing so for digital because you cribbed the metadata early and didn't update both files, then you're just taking away an opportunity for somebody to recognize and see, that see, the, see the recognition that a book was given. And I think as well that digital presence, essentially digital formats, are putting pressure on the traditional models for territorial rights. It's no longer the case that you can wait months to years to sell rights. The, the, time, the lag time is, is to, uh, declining and I think in some cases precipitously. When it comes to describing rights, uh, some of the challenges are uh, as simple as the, the contracts that were initially signed for what a publisher acquired and what it was licensing. They're documents, not databases, and for most publishers there's no standard set of definitions and it's really difficult to access a full uh, ready view of rights that are available. Um, the handshake agreements that existed for uh, for years on physical products, essentially we're going to give you the right to, to print and distribute or to translate and distribute this book in this market, um, now really don't work. And the formats that are, that are affiliated with digital formats, I'm sorry, the descriptions that are affiliated with, form with digital formats vary by sender and recipient and that can create chaos at, at the consumer level. Um, we're also talking about essentially a multi-dimensional problem because you have geographic, uh, it could be worldwide, worldwide excluding or specific country or markets. It can also be specific languages and it can be customized within that. And then uh, simple descriptions like available for sale and not available for sale, uh, those, those things are often not, the, the flags are not accurately ticked and therefore a book can be either made, a sale, made available for sale in, in an area where rights have not been cleared or the opposite. Uh, neither is a particularly good situation. So, actually I've jumped ahead. Let me just go back a second. Um, the things that we think need to be done uh, are actually very consistent and, and a good setup for the work that Mark's going to describe. The first is that you've got to deconstruct contracts. Um, rights information no longer can be uh, something that's an archive. It really has to be a database and not an interpretation of a contract. Um, there really needs to be much better and, and more standard definitions. Um, there are a number of organizations that are named here that are working on this. BISG has had a, uh, a, an active rights effort for the last three years and it uh, hopefully will make significant progress in the next 15 months. 
Um, and then internal to any organization, publisher in particular, Right Central, you know, it's a core part of what a publisher's added value is. That they are essentially a rights clearinghouse. Um, and then for publishers that are active in doing conversions, they have to actively talk to the supply chain partners, not just the uh, conversion house, although that's a very important conversation that we'll get into in a minute, but also uh, the re data recipients who are working with the data that you have. So, and with that, I'll turn it over to Mark. Okay, thank you, Brian. Um, so this is actually, you know, we talk about metadata as being data about data. This is uh, I, this, this picture actually is the copyright files at the Library of Congress, which is clearly data about data. So these are metadata files which still exist going back quite a few years. Um, uh, I'm, gonna t I'm, I'm sort of taking a little bit of a leap. I mean, so far we've been talking about metadata in, in terms of how it relates to books and how it relates about the content, but I, I think uh, a lot of what's going on right now is digging a little deeper with metadata about what's inside the book and what's inside the document. And, uh, and there's three major areas that, that, you know, uh, that, that, that I see when we talk about this. And, uh, uh, and I'm going to I'm going to hone in on some of these. It's really much more than can be talked about in in 20 minutes. Uh, but uh, but I think one major area is just findability, and uh, and a major area, a major uh, issue that many publishers are, are are dealing with, and many people who have content of all kinds, even if they're not publishers, although I guess everybody's putting out content as a publisher at some level, is that there's just sheer volume of information out there uh, makes it very hard to find anything. And it requires more and more precise metadata in order to find anything, even for non-book content. So just findability along that level. And and what that does is, uh, I mean, if you if you can find uh, if you make information more findable, uh, it increases readership for publishers and authors, and it allows you know a lot of information now goes out not through the traditional bookseller chain but through various aggregators and distributors. It allows those aggregated distributors to to make your content more findable. We spoke a little about that before. Uh, the next area is digital rights management with, and, and in a number of areas, but uh, uh, rights management has changed a lot, as Brian mentioned, but it's down to the point that really, uh, today, one of the biggest issues I see is when you try to convert a, a textbook, for example, for digital, uh, each of those images might have different rights issues associated with it. And the image may have been allowed for a print version, but not for an online version, but allowed for a US online version, but not elsewhere. So keeping track of all that has become a major, a major problem. We also have uh, a whole new publishing area today with open access, where, where pu publishers are signing contracts with authors and universities uh, that that uh, materials will be available without charge, but there are different charging rates that are coming along before that, and you also have uh, research uh, grants that are that make certain materials subject to 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 different rights. So keeping track of all that as you come as as, as it comes to so it, it's getting more and more interesting as we go along. And I think a, a third area which I think has become more and more important now is that. Uh, is what I call honing in on the details. Uh, because you have so much information available online various, uh, in various uh, uh, online directories, various places, you can, uh, there are, you know, you know the, the general terms that have been available in, in, uh, in, in for example, in, in, in book metadata is no longer good enough to find very, something very specific. Uh, if, if, if you had a thousand things to look at, well, that's good enough. If you have a million or ten million or a hundred million, it becomes very hard. Just think about you know how you do searches on Google and how many entries you get back. Uh, and, and and people are selling smaller and smaller pieces of information. It's not just the whole book anymore. It could be a chapter in the book. It could be a part of the book. And an, uh, an area that's become more important also has been just uh, compliance for people with disabilities. It's 508, 88. There's a lot of textbooks are required to be uh, to be to to be made available in a form uh, that. Uh, that, that is available to the disabled, and that requires a lot of metadata inside the chapter, each image, things like that. Uh, so, so I think all those are areas that are making, changing the definition of metadata a little bit. 
So I, I'll, I'm just going to talk about a few different cases and try to cover about uh, four or five of the things that I spoke about over here. Uh, one is, uh, 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 an, 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 uh, you know, in the and, and a lot of our experience is more in more like scientific materials and journals and other you know, materials like that. Much of that material to the educational market, to the school market, uh, to the technical market is made available through aggregators and various distributors. And 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 the way it works is uh, that. Uh, 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 they, they make a lot of metadata available, so when you start searching against, uh, against licensed material that's purchased by university, for example, uh, you'll find the things that are, uh, you know, you start searching and you find certain things there. Uh, uh, the, 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 the publisher's challenge is to make sure that their material is what shows up when, when somebody's searching against this aggregator file. Uh, and, and uh, each, a publisher may be selling uh, to 10, 15, 20 different aggregators to try to get as much coverage as possible. Um, and uh, and, and, uh, and uh, uh, the, more, the more time your content is found and access, the higher your readership, probably revenue models go against that. And you're really competing with everyone else when you're doing that, with all the other people that that aggregator is working with. So the challenge has always been to, to make your content easy for the aggregator to, to make findable. It's a little like uh, search engine optimism, the SEO, when, you, when you're trying to put, you know, make your website findable. Uh, and each aggregator has its own challenges. Each aggregator has its own requirement. All the metadata is metadata, as I sort of spoke about before. Uh, there are many variations. There are uh, some are looking for some things, some are looking for other things. And what I think many people are finding is you're just delivering just generic metadata without thinking about it very much, and and just sending out what you have, and and uh, and uh, you know not honing it in to what a specific aggregator, a specific market is is dealing with. They'll load it up for you, but not necessarily in a way that's best for you. Uh, and if you're missing data, uh, metadata, that'll be okay with them, but they might be defaulting it to a, a setting that's not, not the best for you. So I think when, when, uh, when uh, it's very important when you're putting out your data out and collecting metadata, you plan ahead. And first of all, collect some metadata you may not be collecting today, uh, and make sure you develop feeds of your data to send to distributors in the precise form that they're looking for. Uh, don't rely on them to, to do that work for you. And I think be ready with some of the specialized metadata that some distributors will require. I'll speak a little bit about more of that later. Just one example, um, uh, this I just took off the EBSCO website. Uh, and, and this is not for book data, this is for journal data. Uh, but if you look on the left, they have the required metadata. Uh, and it's typical things that you'd be looking at. But then there's a whole bunch of preferred metadata uh, that, you know, if, if you don't put it in, that's OK. Uh, and many people don't. But to the extent that you, can pr you provide that additional information, chances are that, that the things will be found better. Uh, for example, like the required metadata is just an author's last name. Well, the author's first and affiliations and his email, all those are preferred. And that might be held, able to, to help when, you, when somebody's searching out there. And if they give a first and last name, they're more likely to find it rather than all the people who have that same last name. Um, and so on and so forth. And these metadata lists are getting larger and larger all the time for the reasons we discussed. So it's important to keep up with them. And each distributor has one like this. And they're, they're not the same. Um, uh, so moving on to ebooks, which is a whole uh, different, uh, uh, you know, has become a major area over the last three or four years. That uh, thought it was interesting that 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 picture on the right side, which I which I really liked, is uh, from the front of the British Library. Uh, and what was interesting when uh, when I pulled it down is that it immediately came up with a note saying that this is created under the uh, the Creative Commons license. And uh, and here is the metadata that you would have to provide if you're using it. So here's below that picture is the metadata that they provided, which is very good. That they provided because I probably wouldn't. Well, although I would have 
I would have uh, referred to it, I probably wouldn't have put all that information in. So just uh, an example of how, how metadata is, uh, is helpful to have out there, even on a Creative Commons license. Uh, now, what it's trying, to, what I'm using it for is that ebooks have sort of unchained us from print books and the limitations of print books. Uh, actually, the the the, off, the the sculptor's purpose in this was the completely different, which shows how art can be described in many different ways. The author's per, the sculptor's purpose was to show that uh, uh, historical information gets chained into books so that they never get lost. Totally different uh, way of looking at it. Uh, so in ebooks, I think the same issues apply uh, as, uh, as in regular in, in print books, but more so. Why? Because ebooks are more and more discovered electronically. Um, uh, uh, and, and they're easier to find and easier to download, so, and there's become more and more, so many of them out there uh, that it's become more critical. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, e-books are sort of the, uh, I think of as the stepchildren of the book world. Uh, you know, it, it shows up in many different places. It shows up that, you know, a, a, an organization will spend $50,000 to design a book, a print book, but you know, uh, $5,000 to design an ebook sounds like an overwhelming, ridiculous amount of money. So, but you know, sometimes the same design things need to happen. The same applies to the metadata. Uh, so, there's some basic metadata that's usually included: title, author, publisher, language, an ISBN number. Uh, but even simple things like search terms uh, are often ignored, or they're not thought of very, very very much, but yet things like that will mean that when somebody is searching for ebooks, uh, the chances of finding that particular ebook are, are greatly reduced. So again, the same, the same, uh, the same uh, suggestions provide as much better data as the ebook publisher allows. Uh, keywords do deserve a lot more thought than usually given, and and you need to keep an eye out as as more metadata is supported. Uh, the, the next slide I just I just showed up because uh, usually most publishers or most people are going to be distributing ebooks only have six, seven, eight uh, 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 parameters that are available. There's really a lot more parameters there that are out there, and and what what I what I I would suggest, and this came out from the Juto uh, website, which is a which is a, a tool that lets you produce your own ebooks. Um, and 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 they, and they listed. Uh, I guess it looks like about 20 different parameters that they're supporting. And although one publisher only supports six of them, and others support eight of them, and so on, it's a good idea to keep a database that has everything on it, so that as you produce and distribute to different places, you have everything available on a regular basis. Okay. Next, I want to just talk about what I, I, I think of as a pure metadata play. I mean, Elsevier, and we talked about uh, publishers have been, uh, had 500 years to get this done. Elsevier has been around for, I think, about 300 of those years. Uh, so, uh, so Elsevier, uh, uh, you know, if you're in the scientific publishing world, the, they, they talk about this, them being, they, talk, they describe themselves as the largest scientific publisher. One of their uh, major projects that we participated in was the Scopus Bibliographic Database. Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a database with, uh, it had over 3 billion Scopus records in it. And and uh, it's it's being used when you research scientific materials. Uh, going against the Scopus database will find articles not just that Elsevier has published, but that other publishers have published. They've incorporated the the materials from many of the largest scientific publishers. Uh, but the material is going back more than ten years. Uh, and this goes, and the, the database goes to articles, I think, going back about 30 or 40 years. Going more than 10 years was not, was, was not tagged as carefully as the more recent materials. So what I mean by that is that the, the recent materials 
all the bibliographic entries, which are the entries that are referring to all the other materials out there in the world, were tagged with the last name and the first name and the organization's name and the title carefully done and, and, and all those pieces. Uh, uh, so they're, they're very easy to do searches against. Materials going back more than about 10 or 12 years was, were, that wasn't the standard back then. So they weren't tagged as carefully. They weren't broken out by first and last name, for example. They might just have a straight, uh, you know, just, just a bibliographic information there. So, which meant that it was harder to find things, which meant that if your article was 15, 20 years old and somebody was searching for your name, there was a less likelihood that they would find it correctly. Uh, so what what uh, what Elsevier wanted to do was go back and and uh, and uh, retag the older materials. This is something that's pretty common now because you know what any database you built ten years ago or fifteen years ago is not up to the latest standards. Uh, to the extent that you can do that, you you uh, it really improves what you have available. So they came to us and said, "Is there a way to go back against all these uh, uh, previous records?" And we tag them, and is there a way to do it automatically? Um, which is, you know, that it's a pretty. I mean, the, the, their point was, and agreed. There were over 50 million references that had to be retagged. If, any, if somebody had to look at each one of those, you can quickly figure out how many man years it would take. Uh, so we did. We developed automated software that went back using machine learning and uh, uh, techniques to, fig to figure it out and to do an automated, and, and, and did a very good job. I mean, it, they were able to get, uh, I think, over 98% accuracy on much of it. And this is something that ran 24-7 for days and days and days and, 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 and did that. Now, so I, the, the, it was an issues project by itself. I just want to talk a little bit about the results of that. Now, that meant that now, uh, 50 million references that were not so easy to find before were now much more findable. It meant that uh, that uh, any particular author had a much better chance of his, if, if his material being findable. Uh, one of the, and I didn't know too much about H indexes before this project, but uh, an H index is a, is a is an index of, that's maintained uh, for authors and how it's sort of a pop, how how important they are in the industry, and it's a it's a, it's a complex formula, and and raising by a, a tenth of a point or half a point is a big deal. Uh, what we found is uh, uh, was that some authors uh, actually we raised their H index by six points, which which was is tremendous and made some authors very very happy. So if you're in the business of trying to make your authors very happy uh, because the material is more findable. Well, there's a lot to be done if you can improve the, the metadata that you're maintaining. So again, this is really a pure, met all, all the entire Scopus database is really metadata to refer to other materials that are out there in the world. <coughs> uh, going a little to, uh, 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 just in terms of more specialized metadata, I mean, I just this is something from the this is a government agency, AHRQ is the is a agency for healthcare research and quality, and they uh, and, and and they do they sponsor a lot of research and they maintain a lot of things. And I just know I just thought this was this is interesting because uh, when we were looking at their material, they wanted to point out what was important to them as metadata, and it's really very. It's very, really very different than what, what you know, if you're, you're thinking about typical books is important. So, for example, over here, uh, uh, the, you know, the book title is important. You see that on top there, but also the series that it's a part of, the volume is important. Uh, and then what, what's important to them is uh, who the agency that uh, it was prepared for, and the, uh, which is a contract vehicle. Uh, they wanted to know what the address, but also the contract number, which was critical in this kind of business, and who it was prepared for, and then all the investigators that were involved. And they wanted to list all the investigators and what their titles are. So I think those are all things that are critical in that in, in that area. And I think just everybody who's publishing anything needs to think about what's really important in their area, not just for visibility out there and, and, and making sure that uh, materials are sold well, but also to be able to provide very detailed information as it's needed for specialized purposes. 
and which which is brings me to the to the, the I think this is the uh, last slide I want to talk about is that there's a lot more specialized metadata out there, and each field of study has its its own ontology and its own language. Uh, and an ontology is the words, is, I guess it's a language also, it's the words that you describe things in your particular area of study. And, and you know, capturing the metadata that's unique to a subject area uh, allows for much more precise content, you know, finding precise content. And as we get to, uh, you know, getting away from just selling books, but combinations of books or pieces of books, uh, this is becoming more and more important. So uh, just some examples of specialized metadata on work that we've done in the past. Uh, I, I mean, if you're collecting recipes, you know, there's things like time to cook and what the ingredients are and the calorie counts, nutritional diet operation. All those things become important as metadata as you're collecting a, a recipe collection. So, so now once you've got that, if your business is collecting recipes and you've collected 50,000 or 100,000 recipes and you have this kind of information, you can produce, you know, books on their own. You can produce collections on their own. You could uh, do, make sure you can only keep things that take less than 30 minutes to cook, only things that have chocolate in them or <laughs> whatever your area of interest is. Uh, if, you're, if the area is mountain climbing, it's a whole different vocabulary. Geocoding, you know, where that place is, what the trails are, degrees of difficulty. These are words that I saw on the, on, you know, on the Metadale list, the region and the wall. I'm not sure what a crag is, but uh, apparently that was important as we were going through that. If you're a car collector, well, uh, this is just a few of them, but I know car collectors talk in, in, in many different areas. So, uh, medicine law, I'm a skier, so there's like 25 different ways to describe snow. So there's all kinds of different vocabularies that are there. And if you're co building specialized collections, these all become important. So each field of study, this becomes important, especially as this information gets distributed past what you're working with directly, as it goes through the distributors, as you don't have direct control anymore of what people are looking at. So my thoughts are, well, metadata is data about data. That's, what, that's a summary. Another Creative Commons license. Uh, I just, uh, I guess my summary is it's a very fast developing area. Five years, I think 10 years ago, nobody was talking about it, except for the specific book kind of data that we spoke at the beginning. Today, everybody's talking about building ontologies and, and because it's become more and more important. The pace of new content is increasing exponentially out there. Um, and you know the numbers are out there. If every day you look around, there's uh, it's a lot more than there was the day before. So the better you can harness metadata and stay ahead of the curve, the better you can make sure that your content is out there and can be seen and found. And any uh, over to you, Brian. Thanks. I think we're open for questions at this point. Um, and I, I'll turn to Adam. Do we have any from the audience at this moment? Yes, we do, Brian. The first question that's come in is, what is a P&L? Oh, uh, P&L stands for profit and loss. So uh, at some publishers, um, particularly those um, who do educational products um, or um, you know books with a lot of components, they will set up a profit and loss statement for the entire project um, and um, benchmark um, sales against the, the costs that went into developing the project. Great, thank you. The next question that has come in is, what is the best practices for applying and implementing metadata for digital assets such as podcasts, videos, and images that supplement journals. Hmm. Interesting. I don't. I think the reason we're all pausing is because um, that, there aren't any best practices yet. Uh, we're, 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 yeah, we're pausing on <laughs> the best practices side. Yeah. I I I I, th I think right now that I I think it's it's a process developing. I mean I, there is. Uh, 
And uh, in the process of preparing for this, I did find some standards for images that are out there. And there are about 10 or 12 different organizations, including like news organizations and others that, 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 that show you what, what's there. There are really two kinds of metadata you need. One is the technical metadata and what that image is, you know, the, how many pixels across and wide and all those other kinds of things. Uh, and that's, that's a piece of it. Um, the, the other piece is, is uh, and, and you need that for publication, and I think people have always kept those. The other piece is what is that, uh, uh, is, is a, little, uh, a little harder to, to figure out. One is the rights management on an image, which, which exists, it's not all normally with the image, and should be. But traditionally, mm -hmm. I think Brian mentioned this earlier, I mean, it's in contracts, it's in other places. It was good enough to keep separately, but today, if you don't keep it together, you're going to lose it. As, as, for example, these images that I picked up over here. Uh, the third area, uh, so, you know, so then is the, what is the picture about? What are the images in there? What, uh, how do you find things in it? Uh, and that's important when you start looking for images. And a fourth area is the whole uh, 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 508 compliance, adaptability kind of things. Um, uh, people who are blind or, or, or uh, can't see that image. Uh, so to, to be 508 compliant, you have to have a description of the image. You have to talk about the colors. You have to talk about what's in it. You have to, you know, if it's an image of a formula, may may need to have it read. So. Uh, there are certainly talk about best practices. The problem is there are many best practices right now, and it's it's. Uh, I think it's still in the process of coalescing. The um, uh, this is Brian. Uh, two two specific examples that I might point to. The first is with respect to accessibility. A book industry study group has just published uh, a field guide in that area, and it's worth taking a look at. But that's kind of a. It's not a, a small use case, but it's a specific use case of the to answer the question that. Uh, the the participant asked, but I've been working over the last year and a half with um, the University of Michigan Press, which is uh, executing as the lead press on a grant from the Mellon Foundation, specifically to develop a hosting platform for uh, non-text assets, essentially the kinds of, uh, it could be audio files, uh, visual files, uh, source materials, etc. Uh, that would be affiliated with a published monograph from a university press. And from that experience, I can say unequivocally, there is no best practice. And right now, the work that's required to collect and manage metadata is a um, not necessarily a roadblock, but it's a significant consideration for how to make a hosted platform work. Because simply you know, creating a, a, a lockbox where you can preserve it forever, but you can't access it, or you can access it, but it's not really clear how you're going to get there because the metadata is not fully fleshed out, uh, that's not a good outcome. So I think the answer uh, very clearly for the broad use case, which is anything affiliated with a, a particular work, uh, hasn't been solved yet. Thank you, Laura, Brian, and Mark. The next question that has come in is, my organization has a lot of legacy content that needs to be tagged. I'm not sure we can afford a custom technology solution such as that developed that was developed for Elsevier. Are there good enough tools on the market that can automatically scan content and develop metadata? Hmm. <laughs> um. I, I think it depends on, you know, that's, that's one of those questions you answer with, it depends. I mean, there are tools on the market. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be a custom solution. It really depends on what, what the nature of the materials are and what kind of meta needs, that metadata needs to be pulled out. I mean, there certainly are scanning tools out there. There's a, a number of OCR packages that will pull things out. If your material is, in, is uh, in a form that has text in it, there's tools that will extract the text. Um, uh, depending on how you know how you know how big what you're you're trying to do is, and how much metadata you're trying to pull out. Once you've got that, doing it by hand may be the easiest and least expensive way to do it. Um, you know, the, I think the Elsevier example is a uh, is a, is an extreme outlier because there was just so much volume that that the, a, a, a totally automated solution made a lot of sense. Most of the time, it's not a fully automated solution. It's something that some that's a uh, 
that's a, a blend of the two. It's a hybrid solution where you you automate with what you can with uh, uh, what may be off the shelf or slightly customizable off the shelf, and then and then you uh, you review it manually. So uh, again, it's it depends. <laughs> Yeah, and I, and I think that the, the answer in part, it depends upon the structure, how structured the content is that you're, you're trying to extract metadata from. So if you, for example, have a, a dictionary and it's well formatted, this is a simple example, then it's really clear to say this is an entry, this is a definition, this is a, a pronunciation because they follow a very predictable format. The difficulty becomes when you have a blob and you're know, not consistent formatting. Uh, or the underlying work is is was written without any for any reference to formatting, and at that point the content conversion does become fundamentally a manual exercise. Or uh, you have to make, as as Laura was explaining with the PNL reference, a decision about whether or not you're ever going to make enough money to make the investment worthwhile. Exactly. Exactly. Well. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark, Laura, and Brian, for this very informative webinar. That's all the questions we received today. Um, and we'd like to thank everyone for attending. This will conclude today's broadcast. You'll be able to access the recorded version of today's webinar in the archive section of our website located at www.dclab.com. Also, our next webinar will be next Thursday, September 29th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, titled Extracting Funder and Grant Metadata from Journal Articles using language analysis to automatically extract metadata being presented by Mark Gross. Thank you everyone for attending and have a great day.